Dr. Margie Kerr has a PhD in sociology from the University of Pittsburgh, where she currently teaches and conducts research on fear with a focus on how and why people engage with frightening or thrilling material. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Margie Kerr. <laughs> thank you, um, and thank you all for, for coming today and tonight and this whole weekend. I've, I've had such a, a great time, and I've only been here a day, so I'm really looking forward to the, the rest of the convention. Um, so yeah, my name is Margie Kerr. I'm a sociologist uh, who studies fear, and last year I released my book Scream, uh, Chilling Adventures in the Science of Fear, uh, which is all about how and why we engage with these, you know, voluntarily engage with scary material, um, but really the goal is to educate people about fear so that they do have more control over uh, their own threat response and will be less susceptible to being manipulated by, by fear, um, by those who use fear to, to motivate action. Um, so uh, tonight I am going to be talking about the environmental, the physical, the uh, sociological reasons that people may experience a sensed presence or uh, something like seeing a ghost or, or having an a encounter with the, the paranormal. And uh, the term sensed presence, it's a catch-all phrase that uh, shows up in a lot of research whenever we're trying to understand uh, those moments that people describe as being kind of, you know, otherworldly or, uh, or when they see a ghost. But it also... Um, refers to situations where people might say that they are in a commune with God or uh, experiencing a, an outer body presence. or So it, it can be a, a lot of things, but uh, typically is referring to these kind of paranormal type experiences. Um, and when I started you know, doing my research, I, I wanted to see you know, why, why people go to haunted houses, but I also wanted to see you know, why do people go hunting for ghosts? Why do people, um, you know, and pay a lot of money to, to go on, on ghost hunts, and, and I thought maybe maybe there are ghosts out there. I've never had a paranormal experience, um, but I wanted to, to go to places to see, see what all this was about, to try and understand, um, you know, what, what is really happening. And before we even talk about what's happening in the body uh, and the brain uh, during these moments, it's important to think about where these things are, are happening uh, when people say they experience something like this. Uh, and so I, I did a lot of research looking at the most haunted places or the places that, that people report having these type of experiences. And, um, you know, there's hundreds of lists out there. And uh, I, I tried to, to bring some kind of reason to, to figuring out, you know, where people are reporting the, these experiences and came up with a list uh, and then went to, to check them out. So I went to uh, the Takandema Falls in Bogota, uh, Colombia, and it's, a, it's an old hotel that was built on this cliff um, that happened to be the site of an indigenous uh, population's um, uh, kind of mass suicide. Uh, when the Spanish colonizers came, they believed that if they jumped off the waterfall that's right on the other side of this, um, they would uh, turn into to eagles and fly away. And, um, so hundreds of indigenous people ended up uh, dying, and then the hotel was built there, and then uh, a whole bunch of rich people ended up dying, and so they said, well, the place is haunted. Um, I went, and, you know, it's, it's a very beautiful kind of mysterious place, but I didn't see any ghosts. Um, I went to Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in Weston, West Virginia, uh, and this is also kind of notorious for a ghost story of a little girl named Lily who's supposed to hold your hand, and, um, and she is the, the ghost of, of a real girl, a, a, a child who was born by one of the um, uh, patients who was raped and abused by the soldiers who stayed there during, uh, during the war. So I didn't see any ghosts, but I mean, the place itself is, uh, is pretty horrifying. Um, I went to Moundsville State Penitentiary, also in West Virginia. It's interesting how many of these haunted places happen to be in uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia and the, the Northeast in general. Um, Moundsville State Penitentiary uh, during the 1970s was the most violent penitentiary and is, is filled with lots of uh, ghost stories. Uh, I went to the Okigahara Forest, the suicide forest in Japan. Um, it's the second most popular destination for suicide uh, and also uh, uh, some have claimed to be a location for one of the seven gates of hell. Um, 
it's uh, the most, considered the most spiritual place in, in Japan. Uh, the Bogota Cemetery in central uh, Bogota, um, which is filled with lots of famous dead, uh, dead people and, uh, and supposed to be very haunted. Uh, and then the place I, I kind of want to center the conversation around is Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, PA. Has anybody been there? No. It is uh, the oldest penitentiary, the first penitentiary. It was the first prison built uh, based on the idea that uh, you know, prisoners could be rehabilitated, and to be rehabilitated required um, uh, time to reflect and to study the Bible, and so uh, it was all built on solitary confinement. So prisoners would be in their cell for 23 hours a day, an hour outside, but would not see anyone, even the, um, the warden. Um, that didn't last very long, but mostly due to overcrowding, because they just they were like, we've got to put more people in these cells. Um, but it was open from 1829 to 1971, and uh, is the and after it was abandoned in 71, it very quickly started deteriorating. It's amazing when you take away temperature control places just crumble uh, really quickly. And uh, since then, it is, it's now considered one of the most, or the most haunted place in, in the US. Uh, and so I, I spent a lot of time there. I spent the night there in uh, one of their, um, their um, punishment cells, the Klondike, the hole, which are these, small cells that were, it was built in one of the, uh, the tunnels that was used for um, all of their underground kind of piping and they built these cells down there to, to put people in. But uh, I spent time there and then I, I shadowed a paranormal investigation that was there and uh, it's really where I think I kind of brought together a lot of different ideas about this idea of uh, why people have these experiences. Um, and what I quickly realized, uh, there's a lot of common themes with all of these places, and it doesn't really take uh, much science to figure out that some places are scarier than others. You know, and you kind of ask people, I ask my students all the time, and they quickly say places like prisons and asylums and um, nursing homes and uh, you know, places that have seen a lot of death. And a lot of these places are uh, what sociologists, um, Irving Goffman, uh, named total institutions. So places that uh, that confine us typically uh, against our will uh, and uh, are inherently uh, scary because of what they represent, because of what they make us think about, and that's um, confinement and uh, loss of identity uh, and, and isolation. So uh, these places, you know, um, uh, are, are you know, cited as, as being the, the spots for the paranormal uh, because of what they represent. So it's, it's the, the power of place, the power of the space itself. Uh, and I really, I, I thought about that a lot, and there's, there's a lot of research looking at, uh, you know, the power of place and why people like to go to, to these different types of, of uh, you know, locations where there's been history of abuse and, and atrocity, and it's all kind of under the dark tourism um, literature, if any of you are, are familiar with that, it's looking at why people go to, um, you know, say memorial sites even, or, or places of, of tragedy. Uh, and, and we go there uh, because, for, well, for a lot of reasons. Um, so first I, I wanna talk about the, the attraction repulsion dynamic of these places. Um, so these places, they, they do hold an attraction to us because uh, we are attracted uh, to things that are that are scary. That we have a negativity bias, and there's a, a lot of really strong uh, evolutionary kind of um, reasoning behind that. Um, you know, we've evolved to pay attention to things that that could hurt us because we want to remember what uh, you know what could threaten our, our survival in the future. Um, so when we see something that uh, reminds us of, of something scary, of something that could potentially threaten us, then we, we pay attention to it. So they've done lots of studies with um, people showing them pictures of uh, like collages that have either flowers hidden or have uh, weapons hidden, and we see the weapons uh, first, we pay attention to them longer. Same thing when you show people pictures of something that's, you know, say really positive and happy, uh, and something kind of macabre, or, or even um, pictures of mutilation, pictures of fire, of, of explosions, we pay attention to that. And I don't, and I think that coming out of this current um, 
political cycle, we've seen that <laughs> how effective uh, manipulating that can be um, because we, we do want to make sure that we are paying attention to things that, that could threaten us. And so we have this attraction to, to it, but yet at the same time we are repulsed because um, now we're thinking about these things that could hurt us and, uh, and the people that you know, could be uh, kind of perpetuating it. So total institutions, um, they're, they're scary not just because they you know, are the places where monsters are locked away. Um, typically, it's the people with the keys that, that are, uh, are also the monsters. Um, when we step into these places, uh, you know, whether you're going in as a prisoner or a patient or a prison guard, you very much go through a process of re-socialization, of kind of being stripped of your identity, having this new identity, or um, becoming a number, becoming just uh, uh, an object. And so it's very dehumanizing for the, the people who work there, too. So when we're standing in these environments where we can't help but think of that and think of that loss of, of self, the loss of, uh, of being, you know, um, a human that's worthy of rights and respect, and uh, and so that that repulses us, and the things that happen there repulse us. You know, the, remembering the tragic history is I mean, thinking about the abuse that uh, that that did happen in these spaces uh, is is re repulsive. But there is also then this positive side that comes out of this repulsion, and that's that it reminds us of the freedoms that we do have, and it reminds us of the humanity that does exist. So by getting close to things that are, uh, that are evil or uh, scary, we're reminded of, of the opposite. And so people go into places like Eastern State or Trans-Allegheny, and they come out thinking about their own freedoms and appreciating their own rights more, and hopefully then turning that into to positive action to you know, uh, quell any future uh, abuses from happening. So uh, we have this negativity bias. We're attracted to these things that are, uh, that are threatening. Uh, and uh, th it's not, it's, I always tell parents, because they often ask me, you know, oh, my kid is really into horror movies or, you know, serial killers. And, and there, it's very natural. It doesn't, it's not symptomatic of pathology just because you're interested in things that are, um, you know, a, a little bit uh, dark. Um, so... Uh, okay, so moving on from there then, um, oh, this is just a fun, a fun video. A lot of the paranormal investigations, you know, talk about the, uh, the artifacts that show up in videos and audios, and it's just, uh, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, anyway, so uh, the, the power of place. So these places are, uh, are really activating us uh, very strongly from, uh, uh, from uh, what they're making us think about. And so... Uh, it scares us, and, and we um, are often thrust kind of into a, a, a heightened state of sensitivity. Um, we're uh, activated at a very physical level, and that sensitizes us then to other uh, experiences, other, other things that might be happening in our environment. Um, so this is just, yeah, some of the, the footage of the medical ward at Eastern State. It's, it's just super creepy. I mean, it's just, regardless of any ghost, I mean, this place is, is scary and, uh, and just has an eeriness to it because it's not like what we experience in our daily lives. If you're here every day, it probably isn't as novel. But, uh, you know, going in um, from our sterile kind of environments, this is, this is very, very creepy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, these environments that provoke an emotional response and our sympathetic nervous system is activated and we uh, go into fight or flight. So the sympathetic nervous system, um, you know, when it's activated, it, it releases a, a kind of chemical cascade that prepares our body for uh, being, you know, either really powerful to, to fight, to flee. Uh, those aren't the only responses. You know, there is the freezing response. There's also um, no response, kind of the blunted emotional response to, to stress. Uh, but typically, you know, our sympathetic nervous system, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, going into action. We're, um, you know, activating uh, our 
uh, well, noradrenaline, adrenaline are released, our metabolism is getting into high gear, our heart rate starts uh, increasing, we're, our breathing changes, our, our pupils are dilating. All of these things are happening at a physiological level, and it's to prepare us for, for whatever is to come. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that this uh, is also making us more sensitive. They've done really interesting studies with sensitization and found that, you know, say you, if you, you hit someone very lightly, um, the, any sensation directly after that, especially in the surrounding area, is going to feel even more intense. And it's uh, our body's way of, of protecting us during these stressful, potentially painful, threatening situations. Um, we want to make sure that we are, we're, we're, are all, all flags are up and, and we're uh, aware of, of anything that could, that could hurt us. So we're sensitized and our body is just, you know, highly activated. So that means that um, we're uh, going to be kind of paying attention, but in different ways to things that are happening in our environment. Uh, and this is where we can then start talking about um, the things in the environment that could contribute to someone thinking they've had a, a paranormal experience. Uh, let's see, I wanna make sure I'm... Okay, so we're standing in these dark places and, uh, and then all of a sudden we start feeling, you know, the, the uh, tingle down our spine or goosebumps or that feeling that something isn't quite right. And uh, some of that might be due to, to infrasound. Have, have any of you heard of infrasound before? Yeah. So um, I think we often forget that our, our senses, our perceptions are uh, not, uh, you know, like all species, you know, we, we can hear things in a specific range from 20 hertz to 20,000, um, but you look at elephants, they, they can hear at much lower frequencies, bats at much higher frequencies. Uh, it really is incredible when you start thinking about what the world looks like to different species. You know, sharks who can smell blood from miles away, or wolves who can also smell from miles away. I mean, it, it's really uh, just, it just blows my mind to think about, you know, where we're kind of advantaged and where we're limited in our in our senses, so we can we can hear in this uh, in this frequency, um, but of course uh, there all of all of these sounds are happening around us that we're not aware of, and infrasound is uh, the frequency that's, uh, below 20, 20 hertz, and. Uh, there are lots of naturally occurring sources of infrasound. It's 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 pretty. It's not hard. It's expensive to generate. Um, you know, on your own, you have to get one of the the big massive speakers that play it. If you go on online, you can find you know clips that say, "Oh, this is a you know infrasound clip." But you need you actually have to have the the speakers to generate it. Um, so uh, lots of different things can. Uh, can generate infrasound. The uh, supersonic aircrafts, meteors, rocket launchers, uh, volcanoes, um, chemical explosions, severe storms, um, avalanches, so lots of naturally occurring phenomena and man-made technological um, uh, inventions. Um, and uh, while we can't, while we don't perceive that we're hearing these things, our body does register the vibrations. Um, even the, so our, our eyes are very sensitive, so our eyes could register the vibrations, our skin can register the vibrations, uh, and, and, you know, communicate to our, our um, sympathetic nervous system, the amygdala, that, that something you know, isn't quite right. There was this really cool study done in England uh, that, uh, and there have been studies done with infrasound sense comparing uh, people's responses to a performance, one where infrasound was present and one where it wasn't. And they asked them a whole host of questions, but some of them had to do with how they felt, like if they felt tense or if they felt uh, fearful or sorrowful. sorrowful. Uh, and they found that those who had been exposed to the infrasound uh, reported higher feelings of, of, of fear, of discomfort, of, um, uh, what was the other words they used, of just kind of like something just wasn't quite right. Oh, feelings of revulsion, uneasiness, sorrow. Uh, and I've experimented with it myself, and it does, for me, it, it feels more like suffocating. You do feel uh, a, a kind of... Um, just a, a, a discomfort. It really is just this ugh, feeling, but um, not everybody responds to it the same way. Um, but 
it's, uh, it's a naturally occurring thing. There's nothing supernatural about it. Uh, and you can see that uh, you know, other animals respond to it as well. Uh, during the tsunami in Japan, there were reports of dogs and uh, animals fleeing to the mountains because they were sensing and, and the infrasound uh, of the, the coming uh, tsunami. And um, uh, so... So it is, uh, oh, and it's also actually um, responsible for the, the hum in the UK. This is a really interesting phenomenon. If you're ever interested in doing some kind of Wikipedia adventuring is looking up the hum. Uh, and it's, um, some people report that it, it, it's responsible for their depression, for you know, serious behavioral kinds of consequences. And, uh, and it's due to, um, uh, it's, uh, they believe, a manufacturing plant uh, that is generating this this sound. Um, so uh, the places that people go to conduct paranormal investigations, or that they or places where people are reporting uh, these feelings, are great locations for infrasound too. They've got lots of old HVAC systems that are no longer in use that have holes that have uh, rum, you know old floorboards, just old construction material, just all kinds of, uh, lots of wind passages from, you know, broken down walls and uh, fallen in roofs. Uh, so they're, they're really great for generating infrasound. And, uh, and that could be a likely reason that people are uh, experiencing that feeling of uh, not, being, not being alone or that somebody, uh, you know, is, is right there with them. Um, okay, so... Uh, oh, one thing I, I didn't mention that I also wanted to, to mention about the, the power of place is that uh, these places, they, they do generate that nostalgic feeling too, uh, which is a, an emotional response. It's a, it's a real physical thing that's happening when, you know, we're thinking about the past, we're feeling connected to something bigger than ourselves. And uh, these places, you know, they in some ways are the, the closest thing we can get to time travel because we can kind of witness the passage of time through, you know, standing in in the presence of their, their walls, and uh, just thinking about that can, can be powerful and, and get our emotions going. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's infrasound. Another uh, explanation or, or uh, scientific reason that some people could be experiencing these things in, in these types of locations is because they are often isolated. Uh, they're often um, very... Um, uh, very much in, in sensory deprived kind of environments. So, uh, you know, the kind of MO for a paranormal investigation uh, is to go someplace and just sit there in the dark uh, for, for a long time. Um, that's, that's kind of, the, and then you bring your equipment or whatever and you're just sitting there in the, in the total darkness. And, you know, we know from lots and lots of research that sensory deprivation can have very fast and very uh, profound consequences on uh, our um, ability to to kind of judge what's happening in our brain and our environment. Um, so, so yes, the, the human psyche responds swiftly when isolated, uh, when isolation is deprived with, or coupled with sensory deprivation. So the way that our, our brains work is they're just, they're constantly processing. They're processing information at just, that's, that's what they do. Uh, and the uh, way that we know about our environment is through a constant kind of comparative um, processing. So we're, we're bringing information in, we're figuring out what it means, we're comparing it to uh, expected uh, or anticipated outcomes. And when you take all of that away, uh, it still wants to process, it still wants to to try and, and, and run, and so it starts making things up. Um, and that's where hallucinations come from, both visual and auditory. Uh, it's, it's our brains just trying to, to, to run, to, to process. Uh, and it's amazing how fast this can happen. Uh, there was one study that was done, when was it? It was 1957, it was before there were strong ethical um, uh, boundaries and IRBs um, that wanted to show the the consequences of isolation and he was supposed to run this experiment for several weeks where students would be completely deprived of, of all stimulation uh, and isolated and <clears throat> They found that uh, the impact, the, the consequences started showing up after only a couple of hours. Um, and the, and they, nobody made it past, I think, a, a, yeah, nobody made it a full week. Uh, and um, 
so we were able to see that it, it, is, it happens really quickly. And what's interesting and important, though, is also the, the context. So, you know, you do have things like float tanks, uh, which are sensory deprivation tanks. Uh, and in that context, it can be experienced as peaceful and uh, meditative. Uh, and the difference is, of course, intention and uh, preserved agency, so you have the ability to leave at any time, uh, whereas if you are, you know, um, in some place that, that you can't leave, uh, say a prison cell, um, the um, breakdown happens much more quickly. Um, so, so, yes, so the, the sensory deprivation, so people who are sitting in, in these dark rooms, no stimulation, um, <clears throat> their brain is going to be working to try and, and create something to, uh, to engage it. And, you know, again, the, and we'll talk about placebo, of course, but, um, you know, people are going in to find ghosts. So if they're sitting in a dark room, um, seeing ghosts, hearing ghosts is, is, is highly, uh, highly likely. Uh, so the, the next uh, thing I, I wanted to, to look at is this, this idea, this chills down the spine, um, uh, which is often cited um, f from those who, who have had a paranormal experience uh, as kind of the evidence that, that you know, they, they've got the, the chills down the spine, they've got goosebumps, there's something there with them, there's another presence in the room. Uh, and I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what's happening in the body with, with this, uh, the tingling sensation, because they're not all the same. Um, there's the fever chills, uh, and that's uh, our body is, is fighting an infection, and uh, we are, our, our body is, uh, is trying to increase the fever through a, a rapid kind of um, uh, uh, temperature fluctuations in our skin. And so th those are the fever chills that we're feeling. We're trying to raise our temperature, fight the infection. Um, that's different than, than frission, uh, which, again, this term is, is it's a concept that's used, but still, you know, the disentangling frission from goosebumps and what I'll talk about, the ASMR, the, it's, the, it's not like there's very definitive in how boundaries been in, uh, behind these frission and goosebumps. But Frision is that feeling that people um, describe having when they hear a, a song they really like or, you know, that deep kind of um, uh, tingling sensation when, you know, Adele comes on. Um, so some people relate it to, to frequencies, but uh, it is a, a physical sensation that you feel uh, usually motivated by strong emotional content or content that you've linked to strong emotions to. And then, of course, there's goosebumps, uh, the pyloreaction. erection, uh, and and I think that this, I think, you know, they're still trying to understand goosebumps and, and why it happens. And the best theories are those that say it's kind of an evolutionary holdover from, um, you know, when we, when kind of having um, the ability to make ourselves look bigger would actually be a deterrent in uh, in, in fighting a foe. Um, for example, like, oh wait, where is this? That guy, uh, you know, dinosaurs. Um, so uh, the pyloreaction, erection, yeah, the, the idea is that, you know, uh, like cats, we would be able to make ourselves look bigger. And so now we just have these tiny little hairs and that's kind of our, our way of, you know, fluffing up. Um, so, um, and then uh, there's the, uh, the auto, autonomous sensory meridian response. Have any of you guys heard of this? I, I was I was immediately fascinated by this entire idea, uh, and I actually came across the uh, discussions of ASMR because I was trying to explain the experience that I had myself at Eastern State with the paranormal investigation group, um, because I did experience a very strong kind of physical reaction, and um, you know I didn't think it was a ghost, but I wanted to figure out like what you know what what went into this, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but. Um, ASMR, it's, uh, it's the, the, this, this concept was kind of crowdsourced and, and named. It's not a, um, you know, it, it didn't come out of the scientific community, but there have, uh, just in the past year, been a few studies looking at it, and uh, we need a lot more physiological research looking at it to see if it's a distinct kind of um, 
experience in the body, but uh, basically what it is is this, it, it feels like a ghost is walking through you. Um, so you get kind of this sensation that starts usually on the top of your head or in your back, and it moves all the way through you, and you feel the best description I, I found was like a carbonated beverage is being poured under your skin. It's just that all over tingling body sensation, uh, and it lasts for a long time. So, you know, like 5, 10, 15 minutes, some people say, and it's distinct, at least people say it's distinct from that feeling that you get when you hear a really good song or, uh, or goosebumps. Um, and the, the research that's been done on it uh, has largely been self-report, and people say that, you know, they do experience positive um, uh, consequences from activating ASMR, and it's interesting what they use to to activate it, you can go online, and I, I suggest everybody does because it's really it's interesting. There are these ASMR trigger videos, uh, and it's a lot of things like like tapping on um, on wood with nails, like that sound that will trigger people, or um, the crinkling bags, or uh, usually auditory kind of triggers that will uh, work for for. Um, specific people. Also Bob Ross painting, watching Bob Ross paint. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting and, and you know you, you see some of the things and you're like, yeah I get that. I do kind of really like that sound and, um, and so uh, for me when I was doing the paranormal investigation I, uh, I was watching this, this group of folks. They were sitting outside one of the cells. They had an uh, old school cassette player, so the, the kind where you put the tape in and you have to press record and play at the same time. And, um, and then you, they set that out and they have you know, all of this other equipment and, and then we just sat there and stared into the black empty prison cell um, for probably 15 minutes. And, and that's when I felt this kind of all over body kind of like, ooh. Uh, and and I, I've, you know, remember thinking at the time, gosh, that this audio cassette, this reminds me so much of when I was a kid recording songs off the radio and then playing them back in my room and so excited about like in vogue. And I had this very powerful memory of doing that. And, uh, and so I, I think that, that that is what was happening is that, you know, these strong emotional responses uh, have very real um, physiological uh, um, consequences. And so, so we feel it in our body. Um, and uh, what people report, though, is that it has a, a, a soothing, relaxing effect. And, you know, if it is because it's activating this strong emotional response, that also makes sense because, you know, things like an endorphin, serotonin, dopamine, all of these things are released um, when our sympathetic nervous system is activated. So, uh, you know, there, that could be kind of the positive reinforcement that people get from, from doing these things is they're, they're getting, you know, that physical kind of natural high from it. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Moving on to then the brain. So what is happening when people say that they, you know, are experiencing a, another person next to them when they, they think that there really is something else in the room? Uh, there's been... Uh, uh, recently, um, uh, a handful of um, fMRI studies trying to look at, at what could potentially be happening, and they've done them with Carloma, Car Carloma, yeah, with uh, highly religious nuns. Uh, and um, <laughs> sorry, sometimes I just when I'm speaking publicly, I'm like just move on. Uh, um, but uh, and also people who have temporal lobe epilepsy and. Uh, and then other studies, too, that have shown, like, okay, the temporal lobe is the, the one part of our brain that is um, really concerned with uh, the sense of self and, and other. So where we are, you know, kind of doing the body ownership. Other parts of the brain are, are involved, too, but uh, this, plays, this part plays a, a key role. And they learned uh, from people with temporal lobe epilepsy uh, and people who experience the uh, Gestalt Gershwin syndrome, uh, which hap can happen during a uh, seizure, uh, that when that part of the brain is disrupted, it does generate this feeling of, of a sensed presence of, of something else besides us. And the studies with the nuns uh, showed that they, they are, and uh, Buddhist monks too can, can 
sort of meditate, can pray themselves into this uh, different mind state. Uh, and those of you who have worked with meditation and, um, and read into it, you know, it is a powerful skill that you can develop to, to kind of get yourself into, into a different kind of headspace. Uh, the reasoning then that you bring to that is going to be influenced by, by religion. But um, it, it, at a, you know, neurological level there are there are brain patterns that that researchers have been able to see during these these times um, and uh, uh, let's see okay uh, yeah oh the one other research point I wanted to share too is when um, they've had uh, Buddhist monks in fMRI um, studies and they've asked them, to you know, go into these highly meditative states. Uh, what's interesting is different parts of their brain that are responsible for vision are, are also activated. And when they're saying that they are, you know, um, either seeing things or experiencing things, those parts of their brain are being activated. So it is happening at a, at a neurological uh, level, and, and it just highlights, I think, the power of our brain. Um, the the something that I think we kind of know intuitively, but never really give enough attention to, is that thinking has real physiological you know, outcomes, thinking, the way we think changes what our, our body is doing. Um, and that's where we get to the power of, of expectation. Um, we hate dissonance. We hate, we hate when competing things are, are in front of us. We just want to make them make sense. Have, have any of you heard of the, um, uh, oh, people call it different things, but it's basically when you're, when you're on a bridge uh, and you just, you're afraid you're just going to jump. Um, not because you want to kill yourself or anything, but you just keep thinking, just don't, don't do it. Don't, maybe, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only one who does that. Right? Like, like you're like, no, don't jump. Don't go too close. You're going to jump. And, and it's, um, oh, high places syndrome. Um, but what it is is that's, uh, they, they think that that's our brain trying to uh, decrease the dissonance. Here's this thing we're super afraid of. We're super afraid of jumping. Um, we don't want to be do, feeling that anymore. And so we think that, the way to make it stop is to just go ahead and do it. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> for people with impulse control problems, it's, it's, it's a hard time. Um, so, but we, our brain, we, we, we build our lives based on our experiential knowledge, on, you know, the, the facts that we've kind of learned, and uh, we uh, are constantly kind of trying to seek to make um, our expectations match our experiences. And, uh, and this has broader consequences beyond experiencing a sensed presence, especially when it, you get to things like uh, abuse and trauma as people try to rectify, you know, especially in, uh, for children, why, why they were abused. Oh, it must be because, you know, they did something wrong. And that's, again, a, our brain trying to, to, to not have these competing things happening. So uh, when people go into a space expecting to, to find ghosts, when they experience a physiological reaction, then they'll attribute that to, uh, to paranormal um, uh, uh, experiences or paranormal uh, influences because that makes sense. That's matching experience and expectation. Uh, and there's, of course, the placebo thrown in there, too. Um, you know, there may be no environmental influences, no infrasound, no uh, kinds of sensory um, uh, deprivation, but we just want it so badly that uh, we can make it happen. And the research that's been done with placebo is just really incredible, and I, I encourage you all to look at it because, I mean, the... Um, I think the one that was the the um, most powerful for me is that you know with even looking at um, uh, drugs like oxycontin and really powerful narcotics, um, telling people that they're going to to be receiving them, that's when their body actually starts producing their own endorphins and uh, their own pain management system. So it's just uh, there's so much power to be um, harnessed with with placebo. Uh, so it's not then difficult to understand that if, if people really want this thing to happen, that they're, they're, they'll, they'll make their body uh, experience something. Um, so then the, uh, let's see, uh, then there's transmagnetic or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, I, I imagine are, are many of you familiar with um, Persinger and the God Helmet? 
Um, and there's a, you know, it, it seems to come back every few years, but the, the idea that the weak magnetic uh, fields can generate the feeling of sense presence, and it's been uh, debunked a number of times. Um, but what is true is that powerful magnetic stimulation, so this is one Tesla, this is, this is done in a lab with these, these coils that are uh, very, very um, specifically placed in uh, locations uh, over the brain. Um, and you are, you know, you are then uh, exposed to a, about one Tesla worth of, of uh, magnetic stimulation, and, and that can induce feelings of a sensed presence. Um, you know, that can make you feel like there's this shadowy figure, and this is from a, a study that was done um, fairly recently, uh, where the person felt like when this certain part of their brain uh, was exposed to it, that there was this shadowy figure behind them. Uh, so then the, um, you know, uh, some that say, oh, well, then if you're out in the world and exposed to magnetic fields, the same thing could happen. But no, I mean, this is, this is powerful magnetic fields. It's not going to result from, you know, the... Um, uh, uh, just magnetic fields that we find in, in everyday world. I mean, I think um, Persinger's God Helmet was using the strength of around like a refrigerator magnet. So um, this, is, this is very powerful stuff. But the, the TMS is very uh, promising for treating depression, um, uh, OCD, uh, a, a whole bunch of different things. They're, they're very excited about the uh, potential for, for this. But the, the question is how long the, the, it lasts. I have a colleague who's using it for um, a changing sexual arousal, and they, the, the effects are good for about 30 minutes um, afterwards. So, uh, so there's a question of how long the, the changes really, um, really last. Um, okay, let's see here. All right, so then the, uh, the final uh, kind of segment of, of why people feel this is that it's it's linked to the personality trait of, of being open to engagement. Um, some people are just more open, uh, more su highly suggestible than others. When they redid the God Helmet studies, they found that a better predictor of uh, whether or not someone had a, a sensed presence experience was how suggestible they were. So what their, their this uh, relatively stable personality trait, uh, what that was. And, uh, and it is something that does, you know, kind of uh, come to form very early in life and, and tends to, to be, be pretty stable. You know, are you open to trying new foods? How much uncertainty are you comfortable with? When you go into an environment, are you ready to say, okay, yeah, count me in, I'm all in, or are you more kind of, a few more reserved, uh, longer to, to kind of uh, get into uh, whatever new environment you're in. So being open to engagement, being highly suggestible is, uh, is a great predictor of whether or not you're going to, to uh, experience something um, uh, paranormal. Uh, it doesn't mean that, and when I say that, sometimes people think, oh, well, that, that just means that, you know, people who are um, uh, an easy mark, but it's, it's not that. It's, it really is just about um, people's tolerance with, with uncertainty and, and tolerance with, uh, uh, with new things, based, well, with uncertainty. Uh, and you can challenge that in yourself. You know, if you, you know that you're someone who isn't very um, comfortable with new things, you can start to slowly try and and uh, open yourself up to, to doing new things and just become more open to engagement. Because it, once you kind of master that ability, um, it can be really fun. You can, you can you know, more easily suspend your disbelief and get carried away into a board game, into a, uh, you know, a video game, into a haunted house or a movie. Just, just let yourself kind of lean in, so to speak. Um, so uh, let's see here. Okay, so then finally, feelings are contagious. So uh, this is a, and not contagious, of course, in the literal sense, but uh, the way that we understand what uh, another person is, is doing, what another person is experiencing, is by recreating that in ourselves. So this is, this is, this is empathy. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about the mirror neurons, but those are mostly only in the motor cortex. The uh, empathy really is, it's a full brain kind of uh, um, system. And what happens is when we see someone crying, well, we want to relate, we want to understand. And so we, you know, generate that same kind of uh, uh, experience in ourselves to, to a slightly lesser degree. Uh, so they've done studies looking at people and fMRIs who are, you know, having a strong emotion and then 
um, looking at them when they are watching someone else have a strong emotion, and it's the same areas of the brain that are, are activated. And so that's, that's why we, we experience empathy, is because we really truly are feeling it ourselves too. Um, but mostly just the affective, not the, the actual physical sensations. So when we watch someone in a horror movie sawing off their foot, our foot doesn't hurt. But interestingly, uh, the parts of our brain responsible for registering that do light up. They did a really cool study looking at people uh, watching someone have a root canal. And it was the same, you know, those same pain kind of matrix centers are, are activated. So, um, so this is, this is, so if you are with a bunch of friends, and this is the a picture of the cell that we were outside of, I had to take a picture, uh, picture of the, the moment. Um, you know, you're with your friends, you are all, you know, really excited about having this experience. That's going to intensify it. That's going to kind of just add layers to it because you're seeing your friends experience it. Um, and another interesting thing is that co-attention co does intensify emotion. So uh, when we know someone else is seeing the same thing we are, uh, it intensifies our, our experience, our reaction to it. Um, even if we're not in the same room, they did a study putting people in two different rooms and showing them both uh, the same movie, and when they knew that someone else was watching the same movie, they rated their uh, responses as more intense, which I think is very cool. It kind of, to me, suggests we really have evolved to, to, to understand, to be together, to, to kind of share in this whole emotional kind of experience thing. Um, so co-attention, it intensifies emotions, and you can see that, it, you know, I love watching kids because one starts laughing, everybody starts laughing, and uh, same thing with crying, you know, it's just, we're, we're there together trying to, uh, trying to, to figure out this world. Um, so uh, that, that kind of is the, the science of sensed presence, and, uh, and I think that, you know, we, um, can kind of we do we we like to pick the explanations that work best for us and uh, but I love understanding the science behind it and what what is happening at a physical level and understanding what our brain is capable of because it, it truly is is amazing uh, so thank you all so much and thank you uh, Skepticon planners organizers volunteers this has been a great experience so far everything has been uh, really wonderful and I've really enjoyed talking to all of you and I look forward to. Uh, next two days of more great conversation. So, and I'm open for questions if you want. Thanks.